Okay, it should be going. <laughs> yep, it is. So I have it on my phone. So then I'll be able to see comments. Okay. I I can't keep this going on mine. It's got a lag, so I'm like, I can't. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not gonna watch it. I'm just gonna have it here <laughs> so I can see the comments. <laughs> Three people in it. For the people already in here, we'll get started at 12. Just going to give people time to sign in. Hi, CJ. This is a women's health pelvic floor webinar. If you want to stick around. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a big lag. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, I can't watch this at the same time. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Kristen. Okay, it's 12 o'clock, so we can get started. Um, so my name's Jocelyn. I'm a physical therapist in the South Florida area. We are going to be covering a bunch of pelvic floor common problems today. So Melissa, just so you know what's happening, I'm enlarging this list of the topics we're going to be covering. Incontinence, core exercise, diastasis, prolapse, and pelvic pain. So you'll see here some statistics on how many women are affected by these things. Um, up to half of the women experience incontinence, three and four women. Up to three and four women get prolapse at some point in their life. And up to one in seven women experience pelvic pain in, at some point in their life. So these um, issues are really, really common. I work more with the athletic population, so barbell athletes, people that do sports like CrossFit and um, Olympic weightlifting, different strength sports, and really specialize mostly in helping people combat pelvic problems like incontinence and such within that sport. Melissa has a broader scope and treats people with pain and all kinds of stuff. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring her on today because she has a broader scope than I do and she'll be able to um, give you guys a lot more information. So Melissa, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming on and joining us. My name is Dr. Melissa Trophy. I am the owner of New Quest Physical Therapy and I'm a mobile practice serving New York and Connecticut. And as Jocelyn mentioned, one of my specialties is pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, right now, I'm just treating women, and the, as you're going to see from this webinar, there's a lot of different complications that can occur with the pelvic floor that a lot of women are being told are normal, when in fact they're not normal. They're just really common. So 
our goal is to kind of get the word out to women like you guys and then you guys spread the word on ways that you can combat these issues and not have to live with them for the rest of your lives. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of these issues are also really under undertreated. We don't we don't get told that these are things that we can fix and we can stay exercising. So then women stop exercising and they enter menopause in the later years in life already with decreased bone density, chronic diseases, all the things that come along with decreasing your activity level. So at least for me, the reason that I started approaching these issues is because I want to keep people in the gym because that is what leads to long-term quality of life. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that before we start covering the topics? Melissa? Me? Oh, no, I'm good. Thank okay, you. Cool. Um, so, <laughs> There's a leg, so it took me a little while. <laughs> so, I have this open on the on my phone, so if anybody has any questions, just leave them in the comments, and then I'll say the question on here so we can answer it for you. Other than that, we're just going to move through these different topics, and if you have a question anytime along the way, just type it in while you're watching. Um, so... We're going to approach this in the format of addressing common myths that women are exposed to. The first one is that it's normal to pee when you exercise. So this is something that happens to a lot of women, again, up to as many as half of all women and 28 to 50% of athletes. It's a broad range because they don't do a lot of research in this area in the first place. Um, but that said, it is common, but it's not normal. And there's a lot that you can do about urinary incontinence and leaking when you exercise and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how many kids you've had, it's still not normal. And that's one thing that drives me crazy. A lot of OBGYNs will tell women that, oh, just wear a pad or the worst thing is just stop exercising altogether that, because this is common or this is normal when it's actually not and there's something that they can do. Other than, I like to say, put a Band-Aid on it. So wearing a pad while you're working out or putting a Band-Aid on it, you're not addressing what's actually going on. And that's the most likely, it could either be a weakness of the pelvic floor or a tightness of the pelvic floor or a combination of both. Or just a coordination issue too, right? Like just misfiring mm -hmm. the pelvic floor. Um, Andrea just commented, or cough. Yeah. So yes, it can happen even just with coughing and sneezing. It doesn't have to be exercise. But sometimes that can just be a coordina coordination issue, like the pelvic floor isn't firing in preparation for you coughing, which is what's supposed to happen. So mm -hmm. one of the things... Which, uh, that could be a weakness as well. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're here for. <laughs> um, so one of the things we wanted to go over were the different types of incontinence. So the main types that affect women, there are more than this, but the main three are stress, urged, and urge and mixed. Um, stress is what you think of with exercise usually. So you're stressing your system, you're leaking when you cough or sneeze or jump or run. Um, they've, they're usually, you see a lot in media about urinary incontinence with heavy lifting and big deadlifts and stuff like that. There's videos out there of athletes just full on draining their bladders on themselves in the middle of a competition, um, that's actually not as common as leaking with jumping and more impact activities. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, so I passed this on a lot because I learned it in one of my um, advanced pelvic floor courses and I didn't know this was a thing. In CrossFit, it's a big thing for leaking on lifts. And it's actually, like, celebrated, which I didn't know. Yeah. And then we YouTubed it, and we saw that. So um, what happens is that because a lot of women are so used to gaining stability in their core and their pelvic floor by holding their breath on those lifts, that's further sort of weakening the floor. So you can't accommodate for that uh, bladder pressure and, like, additional support for the bladder. So on that lift, your pelvic floor is just like, all right, whatever, I'm going to give up, and that's when the weekends happen. So breathing is really important, and learning how to breathe properly, not only when you go about your day-to-day, -day, but when you're doing exercise, it's really, really important to relieve that stress on the pelvic floor. 
Yeah, and you're right. It has been kind of widely celebrated in the athletic community and the CrossFit community. Like, there's a video out there of a woman doing step-ups, I think, and burpees just in a puddle of urine the whole time. And it's, like, almost celebrated as her being tough and whatnot and pushing through that. But that's not that's not normal, and that's not the message that we should be sending women. Mm-hmm. So that kind of incontinence is stress incontinence. The next kind is urge incontinence. So this is when you suddenly feel like you just absolutely have to go to the bathroom right now and there's nothing that like you can do to stop it. You need to go immediately. Um, this can be created by a, a number of different problems. So it can be a neurological issue. It can um, very often, especially in women that are mostly healthy, be a habitual issue. So if you're the type of person that holds their urine all day, or if you tend to pee just in case before you go to work or before you go work out and that kind of thing, you can start developing urge incontinence. Do you have anything extra on that? No. And then the last one, I covered it. <laughs> the last one is mixed. So that means that it's mixed between the two, stress and urge. So this might be the person that maybe you started with the leaking while you're jumping. And because of that, now you've started going just in case before you exercise. Now you start getting into problems with your bladder being hyperactive and creating those sensations of urge when you don't necessarily want them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, just for the urge stuff, like if you guys are familiar with the Pavlov dog theory, it's like a similar thing. So your body learns, like, I'm going to work, I need to pay. The cheese is not, I need to pay. And, like, if you're ever in a restaurant and there's, like, a line of women in the bathroom, and you're like, that wasn't meant for, like, two seconds. Why is she even bothering? It's all, like, that nervous system adaptation to you, some scenario or situation setting it off as you having, feeling that need to go, whether you actually have to or not. So, um, retraining the bladder is a big part of pelvic floor physical therapy and like trying to retrain your nervous system in the opposite direction so that it's more quote unquote normal for lack of a better term. Kristen just added, I built my incontinence with going in, she's a massage therapist, with going into massage sessions every hour. So I would go at least once an hour and totally untrained my pelvis to work and be strong. So exactly, this is something that happens to teachers, to nurses, to physical therapists, to people that work on a schedule all day long and have to fit in bathroom breaks, even if they don't necessarily have to go. Yeah, totally. So the myth there is that these incontinence issues are normal. What is actually true about that is that these things are not normal and there are tons of tools that you can use to help address them. So... As you can probably see at this point, there's a lot of different things that can cause these problems, weakness, coordination issues, bladder habits, and so on, and combinations of these things. But whatever the combination of factors that is contributing to the problems you're having, there's something that you can do about it. So it might be strengthening, it, which is not just Kegels. We'll talk more about that later. But it might be strengthening it might be um, learning how to manage your pressures or a combination of both. It might be bladder diaries and learning how to retrain your your bladder and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if that is the, um, a problem that you're experiencing, I would definitely recommend reaching out for one-on-one advice to get um, information about what you can do for your specific situation. Let me get this back open. So the next topic we're going to cover is core exercise. And the idea that core exercise means just doing sit-ups and planks and that you're safe to do this after six, usually the recommendation is six weeks after having a baby or having a surgery or having any anything, pretty much anything that can happen to a woman's pelvic floor. The recommendation is to just go back to exercise after six weeks, and I'm laughing because that is so ridiculous because every condition and every human is different. And then I always tell people, so like, in your, pel- your pelvic floor is like 
muscles in your pelvis, for lack of a better term. And your pelvis is like a bowl. So all those muscles are supporting everything. You just have a baby, like, sitting and pressing down on that pelvis floor. Everything's lax. The hormones in your system are still there six weeks postpartum. So for you to just jump back into activity as if nothing happened, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> so, um, returning that pelvic floor and that coordination and the breath work and everything is really, really important to get that down prior to jumping back into what you're doing before you had a baby. Grab the, the model. Oh, yeah. A model. Can you guys see this? Yeah, they should be able to see it. I can see it. Okay. So this is like, this is the pelvic floor. So like I was saying, the pelvic floor, your pelvis is like a bowl. These are your organs that are sitting inside. So you have your intestine, your duodenum, your uterus, and the bladder here. So for one, we can see if there's weakness in the musculature, how those organs then can be pushing down and weighing down, that stretching that musculature out. So that's why it's so important for these muscles to be strong and supportive. Um, and then it's just, yeah, so we need that support in there. We also need it to be uh, flexible just like any other muscle in our body, and we'll talk more about that later when we come to the pain point um, as far as flexibility goes. Yeah. So the analogy that really helped me when I was starting to learn this stuff was to think about a trampoline. So if, like, the part you jump on is your ligaments and your organs and all the stuff that doesn't contract like a muscle – if you think of that as the ligaments, if you had someone pulling the trampoline, people on every edge of the trampoline pulling it and stretching it out so it's more taut, those are your muscles. So if you have more more pull on that trampoline, it's going to be bouncier, it's going to be stronger, it's going to give you more support and like flinging you up in the air like you would jump on a trampoline. So that's what your muscles do. They help to support everything that's inside of your abdominal cavity. So when we think of core work, I like that term, Celine. Oh. <laughs> I got that from <laughs> Anthony Lowe. Um, so when we think of core work, you think abs, right? But your core is really your core, your front, your diaphragm, which sits on top, like underneath your rib cage, and then your pelvic floor, which sits on the bottom, and then everything in the back of your body. So it's like a cylinder. And that's what really makes up your core. And when you just approach core training, like planks and sit-ups, and you're just training your abs, training your abs, training your abs, you're neglecting all the other parts, especially if you are postpartum or just had some kind of procedure that affects your pelvic floor. You're working stuff that probably wasn't as affected as your pelvic floor where you had all that pressure and stuff sitting for nine months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one of the big keys that's missed most often, at least in my experience, with true core work and really starting to rebuild this stuff is breath work. So, Melissa, if you want to talk a little bit about the beginnings of breathing and why that's so important. Mm -hmm. So, like Jocelyn mentioned before, your diaphragm and then it was called your transverse and downwards for the muscle that lives under your six-pack muscle. Um, they're all heavily coordinated with the pelvic floor. And if we don't have the breath work down in that synergistic pattern, then that's kind of where we lose some of our support structure with those, um, those elements. So with the breath work, I always do breath work on day one with my clients um, just to teach them how to coordinate everything. So what you'd like to do is upon inhalation, your pelvic floor should relax, and on exhalation, your pelvic floor does a slight contraction, which means it lifts up towards your, like, towards your upper body, if that makes sense. So it's not like, like a full force squeegle, but it's like the same kind of idea. So inhalation, everything relaxes. Exhalation, your pelvic floor, your abdominals contract. And then since you just mentioned Kegels, one of my big pet peeves, at least, is this idea that Kegels just means, like, practicing stopping your urine while you're peeing. Can you talk about why that is so Don't important do that. not to do that? <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my questions on my boards, and, like, that was the right answer. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and, like, I found that OB is, like, to be like, and just like teaching kegels that way, and just no, that, that kind of backside incontinence 
that care or sorry, that trains your pelvic floor to not relax while you're peeing. So you might not completely empty your bladder. You might go off by sitting just a pattern that should be happening where your pelvic floor relaxes while you're peeing to let all the pee out. So now it's like, oh crap, now I'm going to do a Kegel. I need to contract. And it's just, it's not good. Stop doing it. <laughs> Another thing with the Kegels too is that so um, on day one, I always ask my clients to perform a pelvic floor contraction or a Kegel, and a lot of people aren't doing them correctly, and they don't realize it. So, like, if you're squeezing your butt cheeks together or you're, like, clenching your thighs, a lot of times, like, those muscles will overcompensate for pelvic floor muscles, and you don't even realize that your pelvic floor muscles aren't actually activating, and you're getting more, like, glute work than you are than anything else. Yeah, and then another point on Kegels is that your pelvic floor muscle is just like anything else. And, like, you wouldn't train your bicep by just doing that, right, and just contracting it. So you also have to factor in what's your weakness. Like, do you have poor endurance of your pelvic floor musculature? Do you have trouble exerting a contraction during a more powerful movement or a quick contraction? Do you have trouble holding on to that contraction for long durations of activity, like a bunch of double-unders or a longer run? Like to consider all the same factors you do in regular training because it's a muscle and you would never expect your bicep to get stronger from just doing that. So that is, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. So that pelvic floor contraction, the breath work, all of that I can think of is like the foundations of healthy core work is how I would at least put it. Um, and then on top of that, you build in, learning how to recreate that pressure management and that pelvic floor contraction and all that stuff with the actual movements you're doing. So when you squat, when you run, when you do, when you stand up, when you sneeze and cough, everything that you do throughout the day, we want to start to incorporate those um, foundations into those movements. So to recap, the myth is that core exercise is just sit-ups and planks. And the truth is that core exercise is much more complex than that and you want to learn how to pressurize and stabilize your whole core and then put that into real life stuff. So, let me get this up again. And then with that too, I just want to add, because a lot of women will get like, really they'll get frustrated because they're like I can't get the breath work down or I can't get the coordination down and if you think about it like regardless of whether you're postpartum or whatever you've been working in that compensatory state and not using those muscles appropriately for so long it's not going to come like it seems so easy breathing but if you're not used to that pattern so if this is something that affects you, don't get discouraged that it's not coming, like, at the drop of a hat. It's going to take a while. And then it's And even if it takes a while, it keeps you from having the longer term issues that are going to keep you out of exercising forever. So if you put in the time right. in the beginning, it will pay off in the long run for sure. Mm -hmm. So on to number three, diastasis means you can't ever exercise intensely. So diastasis is the splitting of the abdominal muscles that happens most often when um, during pregnancy and creates that kind of like pooch effect that people want to get rid of and a lot of people think that that means if they get that 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 means that they can't ever exercise at the level that they used to what's your experience been working with people with diastasis
when people ask you if it, the appearance can change at all, how do you answer them? Uh, the political answer, it depends. <laughs> Some women, the appearance, like, it will come back to the way it looks. But um, some women, it doesn't. And it just really depends on the patient. Hold on. They're saying there's no sound. Oh, really? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I'm typing in the chat. Okay, we're back. My microphone's on. We're okay. back. Okay. Okay. What did you guys miss? What was the last thing you heard us talking about? I'll type it. And Nadia, I see your question. I'll bring that up when we get to that section. Okay. I just we guess we can just stay on diastasis. Di di so they heard dia okay. diastasis. So I was asking... So I was asking Melissa how she answers when people ask her if people can improve the appearance of diastasis. And I was saying, um, I give a very political answer, which is it depends. Um, some women, they heal and it looks the way it did before, and some women can't get that appearance back. But um, both cases are, are fine as long as your function is um, what you were doing before. So just because there's still a little bit of a separation there doesn't mean that functionally you can't do the things that you love. It really depends on what your pressure regulation looks like, what your um, strength looks like, what your endurance looks like, and all of that is way more important than what the actual diastasis itself looks like because that's not indicative of dysfunction mm -hmm. in and of itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Is there anything that someone should not do if they don't, if they do have diastasis or any like signs they can look out for that an exercise isn't safe? Um, anything like the, I think the pressure regulation part and making sure you're breathing is the biggest, biggest key. Um, and then again, that really depends. Like I never tell people never do this, never do that because everybody's so different. So it's really, I hate saying it depends, but that's the honest answer. It really depends. That's kind of what I wanted to get out of you. Is that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all of it depends, depends so much. But the last thing that you should do is just stop. But if you find yourself like always straight, right. always holding your breath, always bearing down and pushing while you exercise, then it's definitely something that you should seek professional advice about, even if you're not having pain or anything mm -hmm. yet. Um, does anybody have any questions about diastasis? Do you know any statistics about how many women get diastasis? I don't. Okay. Me neither. I couldn't find that when I was prepping this. Um, so topic number four is prolapse. So, same as diastasis, the myth is that prolapse means you can't ever exercise intensely. And same as diastasis, the, what's actually true boils down to, yes, you almost definitely can. So, with prolapse, um, I was really surprised to find this in the research that it affects up to three and four women. So, even more than... I'm actually shocked with that. Yeah, but that's in the entirety of a lifespan so that took in, uh, into account like elderly people and stuff too but it is really common um, amongst younger women and even people that haven't had a baby
but have been lifting heavy. So it's getting more and more common like in the CrossFit world and stuff. Um, the main thing that people catch on to to realize that they might have a prolapse is feeling a bulging sensation in the perineum. So that means the area around the vagina and the anus. And they'll feel like a bulging kind of pushing down feeling when they're doing stuff. Some people might only feel it when they're doing like a heavy squat. Some people might feel it all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go over the different grades of prolapse? Do you think that's important? Um, yes. Yeah. So it's graded one through four, uh, and three to four is usually indicative of potential surgery. Four is when, like, you can see it. I think it's, I forget what the exact measurement is, but it's, like, a finger's width past the opening of the vagina, uh, that whether it's your uh, uterus that's coming down or your rectum that's coming from below, any organ that sits in that pelvic floor can potentially prolapse if there's some laxity in those muscles and that supportive bowl kind of isn't really doing its job anymore. Oh, and then the bladder too can prolapse. But um, so yeah, grades one through four. And even if you've had prolapse surgery, it doesn't mean that you might not be a candidate for pelvic floor uh, physical therapy or uh, addressing those structures because what happens is, again, like I use my Band-Aid uh, saying, the surgery itself is the Band-Aid. So it fixed the prolapse, but it didn't fix the reason why you had the prolapse, which is elasticity or inability to have that supportive structure intact. Mm -hmm. So even after surgery, pelvic floor physical therapy or training is really a great idea to supplement. Mm -hmm. um, so Nadia's question was, I had two C-sections, but I do have incontinence issues. My mom's bladder prolapsed. I asked the doctor if it could be hereditary, and he said no. So there is no hereditary link, right, unless someone has some kind of, like, connective tissue disorder where they're generally lax, but you would know that already. Um, there is no hereditary link, but there is a horrible amount of information out there on this stuff. And like we said, three in four women experience prolapse. So it's more likely that you will experience in your lifetime than that you won't. And that's because our medical system is truly failing us and not giving us the resources that we need to heal after things like birth and C-section, carrying a baby, being in a heavy lifting sport, endometriosis, any number of issues that can affect the pelvic pelvic region it doesn't it's not just pregnancy and postpartum um so it's not hereditary but essentially all women are vulnerable to it as almost as if it was hereditary mm -hmm. so if you've had um two c-sections and you are experiencing incontinence that is something that you're going to want to address because i would definitely say that if you're already having pressure management issues which is what incontinence is then that can progress to more pressure management issues which could lead to prolapse if it's not already present not everybody who has a prolapse feels it or has any symptoms at all and then and then depending on what position you're in, people could feel prolapse different. So I know some patients will feel prolapse in only standing. Some will feel it lying down only. So like, and then like something like a grade one, which is not, it's not really protruding outside of any opening, but it's still present. You probably necessarily won't feel that, but you'd want to prevent it from potentially reaching a higher grade by combating it early. Yeah. And if it's something that you're comfortable with, what a pelvic floor therapist does if they do internal examination is they can actually look and see if you're experiencing prolapse and give you preventative measures to help keep it from getting getting worse. And the word prolapse and the whole concept is terrifying, honestly, like the idea of your organs falling out of your body. But at these grades one and two, like it's really not that big of a deal. It's something that a ton of women have, just like things like arthritis and herniated discs and these things that we just kind of get at some point in life. And we just have to learn how to manage and then move on to being able to do whatever it is that we want to do. 
So just because we're urging you to seek care if you are having symptoms or have questions or want to know if you have any of these things, it's important to also know that it's not that big of a deal. You can get past it pretty easily, especially if you catch it early and take preventative measures. And just to add, and I say this to everybody in my uh, information sessions too, because it's so messed up, but in Europe, women are required to see a pelvic floor therapist postpartum. And here, a lot of doctors don't even know who we are or what we do. So it's not a death sentence if it's something, a resource that you're looking towards, or it doesn't mean that you're like destined for this crazy life or there's something wrong with you. It's just that it's so relatively new in our country and the word just isn't spread enough about it. Mm -hmm. Just like with everything else having to do with postpartum care, like it's just completely inadequate here. Like other countries, you Mm -hmm. know, maternity leave they get and how much care they get surrounding having a baby. None of that stuff happens here. And we definitely don't have adequate pelvic floor care and even OBGYNs, like I think Melissa mentioned earlier, don't recommend any of this to people or give people any guidance on exercise Mm -hmm. beyond just six weeks and then you're good to go. And you guys can advocate for yourselves and like who anybody you feel would benefit from pet services like this, they can advocate for themselves. So I had a patient, she had an episiotomy in August. She was still leaking as of January. And she went to her OBGYN and her GYN was like, oh, well, I'm going to refer you to a surgeon. And she goes, no, what about pelvic floor physical therapy? And her MD was like, oh, well, what is that? So she's like, I want to script to a pelvic floor therapist right now. So you guys can definitely advocate for yourselves. And it's a great like education point for your MDs too, to know that we're out there and just to let them know that there's a resource beyond medication and surgery and these stupid cover-up potential fixes mm-hmm. without getting to the core of the problem. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading yesterday about that. <laughs> the procedures they use to help fix prolapse and they put like this tape inside of people and the tape has been found to start like after years start breaking down and like eating through organ lining and muscular tissue and stuff and like the surgeries are complete failures. So this is stuff that like advocate for yourself to try to avoid anything like that because it's just there's um, not good research. So we have two questions. Nadia said, I was given medication and I really dislike the side effects. I would rather do alternative exercises. Nadia, do you mean that you're given medication for your pro- for your um, incontinence? I'll type it to her too. And were you even given the option of seeing a public floor therapist or no? Was given med. She didn't say. She just said, I would rather do alternative exercises. Do you often see people get prescribed meds for incontinence? Oh my God, yeah. Either that or they're being told to just wear a pad. Like, it drives me insane. Yeah. <laughs> um, or it, my friend. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, my friend, she's, she's 31, and she had incontinence, and she underwent the bladder mesh surgery, like, years ago, and she's like, I wish I had known that this was even an option, because now she's having all these complications from the mesh. She's 31 now, and she went through the surgery before, like, in her 20s? Oh, yeah. My God. Yeah. Um, and you're How so- crazy is that? Yeah, that's insane. Do these doctors usually, like, actually try to figure out what kind of incontinence it even is? Or are they just passing out meds for who knows what type of incontinence? <laughs> I wonder if they even know there's different types of incontinence or not. <laughs> like, I wonder. Yeah. Um, Nadia, did your doctor ask you any questions about like what kind of incontinence you were experiencing? Oh, yeah, she said she wasn't given the option for, for pelvic floor PT and that they gave her oxybutynin and mybetric. 
Oh. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely Crazy. seek the advice of a pelvic floor physical therapist. You need to figure out what kind of incontinence it is, which after two C-sections, it's probably some kind of pressure core management issue would be the most likely. Um, and then address it with exercise and rehabilitation. I can't advise you to stop taking the medicine, but if you weren't even given that option, there's no reason you should just be taking meds without figuring out what the like the true cause is. I'm sorry that happened. Um, and then Leah asked, hi Leah, do you need a prescription for pelvic floor physical therapy? And so no, in all states now, and in Florida, where we are, and you have direct access too, right? Yep. In all states now, we have direct access. So you can just go see a physical therapist, and then the rest of the rules depend on the state and your insurance and if you're wanting to go through your insurance. So some insurances do pres require a prescription for in order for the insurance to pay, um, but if you just want to walk in and pay money to see a physical therapist, you can do that in every state now. Um, and there's some really good directories out there if you just Google um, pelvic floor physical therapy that you can look up one in your area even. And depending on the problem you have, not everybody needs internal pelvic floor work. A lot of this stuff can get done remotely. So I work with people, probably 25 to 30% of my general caseload is working more remotely with people, sort of like a coach. So we identify the issue, I write their exercise programming and everything, and for a lot of problems, that's enough. It doesn't always have to be mm -hmm. an examination or any hands-on stuff. Um, Nadia said the doctor asked her like two questions, and since it was stress incontinent, she was sent home with meds. Sounds about right. <laughs> um, definitely reach out to one of us after this or find a pelvic floor therapist in your area, but definitely don't just stop and accept meds forever. There's plenty of stuff you can do for stress incontinence. Um, yep. Now Michelle is asking, can a pessary help a grade two cysto and recto seal or will the pessary make your muscles more lazy and will it be needed forever and are over the counter pessaries safe? Uh, as far as over the counter, I always tell people to get fitted for a pessary just to be safe. Um, they're not always needed. I don't really, haven't dealt too much with them, but um, a pelvic floor physical therapist could definitely help you with that too. So yeah, that's just my two cents. I wouldn't stay with the over-the-counter if you can, if it's absolutely needed. Yeah. And, and if just any get fitted properly for one. If anybody is wondering what a pessary even is, it's like a support device, sort of like a Diva Cup, right? that you insert that can help support the pelvic, like do the job of the pelvic floor. Um, and as to whether it will make your muscles more lazy, kind of like anything, like braces, super comfy shoes, arch supports, anything that you depend on forever without doing any other work to address it, yes, can make your muscles more lazy, but that doesn't mean that a pessary doesn't have a, doesn't play a part in your recovery. So. Sometimes people need to wear a back brace for their back to relax and heal and feel better, but then the ultimate goal is to get them back to doing whatever it is they want to do without that external support. A pessary, same thing. You might need that support in the beginning while you're working on your rehabilitation and everything, but eventually most people can stop using it. But for that to be the only, just like with medicine, if that's the only thing you're doing, then yes, it'll probably be harmful in the long run. Um, it is possible to have prolapse so bad that you need a pessary forever. That depends on the severity of it and a pelvic floor therapist doing an internal examination and asking you a lot of good questions could help you figure those kinds of things out. Do you have anything else to add about prolapse? No. Okay, cool. So recapping. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> recapping. The myth is that prolapse means you can't ever exercise intensely again. The truth is that that's not true in almost every single case. There is plenty of stuff that you can do to help move past it and do whatever it is that you want and you love to do, even if you've had prolapse. 
And also, please take away from this that it's very, very, very common. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's something that we just don't learn about and don't learn how to talk about. And tons and tons and tons of women experience it. Okay, so last topic is that pain is something you just have to deal with postpartum. So up to one in seven women experience pelvic pain at some point in their life. And pelvic pain is defined as anything in the perineum, so anything around the area of the vagina to the anus. Um, and then pelvic pain can also present as hip pain, back pain. You can have pain related to pelvic floor problems in other parts of the body without experiencing pelvic floor pain. Melissa, what's been your like most common experience with pelvic pain? Like, do people come to you after trying everything? Have they tried typical ortho PT, or do they usually start experiencing it and then get help immediately? Um. So a lot of times, there's <laughs> the craziness that goes on. It like blows my mind. So a lot of people will see an ortho PT. And I also tell this to everyone, if you're having any issues, especially postpartum, and you're having groin pain, you're having pelvic floor pain, make sure the place you're going to, if you do want a pelvic floor physical therapist, make sure that they have somebody that specializes in the pelvic floor, because a lot of these orthopedic clinics that I'm seeing will say they do, and they're like pushing on people's backs and stretching their hamstrings. And I worked at one of these nightmare clinics. And my director told me to just stretch this woman's hamstring and send her on her way. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Uh, this is before I became a public care therapist. But make sure you know where you're going. So, yeah. So, a lot of women will be going to orthopedic, like a typical orthopedist clinic for months at a time with no relief. Um, I actually have a patient on schedule now. But that's, that's exactly what she went through. Another one is um, if there's pain with sex. The typical thing is, well, you just need to relax or you'll be like, here's a dilator. Just go use the dilator. And it's not that easy. Like, especially if you just had a child, there's nerves in there, there's ligaments in there. And all of that gets just disrupted and it can be really painful. And it's a lot of work. Like, we just got my client to start having sex again and it's been eight weeks. And it, it takes a lot of work. You can't just shove a dilator in there and be ready to go, you know? Yeah. So, um, it's, yeah, it's tough. A lot of stuff out there is just the misinformation is crazy. Mm -hmm. And you made a really good point in that you have to seek someone who specializes in whatever it is that you're seeking help for. So I make the same um, point when I'm talking to my barbell athletes and my CrossFitters. Like, you don't just walk into a regular orthopedic clinic because they have no idea what it is that you do with your body. And unfortunately, the healthcare landscape in general in this country is 100% for profit. So people will take your case and pretend like they know what they're doing as far as helping you, even if they don't quite have all the knowledge that they should. So people like um, Dr. Melissa have spent tons of extra time and money and heart in learning how to treat people with these problems it's not something that every physical therapist just knows how to do so do your research before you go and find someone and most of the time you're gonna if you can't find someone in your area you're gonna be better off working remotely with someone who does specialize in that but maybe lives far away and you can't see them all the time maybe you see them once a month or maybe you don't see them in person at all you're gonna be better off with their with their knowledge Absolutely. Um, so let's go over the different types of pelvic pain. So we mentioned pain like actual, actually in the pelvic region. You can have pain just with sex. You can have pain during or just after exercise. You can have referred pain to the hip and the back. Are there any other referral pains that you see? Um, no, just to like the, you could have pain down your leg too, um, if it, or like in your buttocks, there's something called pudendal neuralgia, which the pudendal nerve lives, um, between the anus and the clitoris. So if you're having any like tingling or nerve pain there, problems, pooping, 
um, anything like that, problems sitting for a prolonged period of time, that could be involved as well. Mm -hmm. And um, same thing with any kind of like back pain, hip pain, glute pain, sciatica, anything in like the pelvic leg region as a woman, whoever you ask for help should be asking you questions about your pelvic floor, about leaking, about your bladder and bowel habits. All of these things can affect sensations in that area. So you can have back pain. I know when I first got diagnosed with fibroids, one of my first symptoms was achy back pain. And because I'm so active, of course, my first thought is that it has to do with athletics and sports. But it was really just because I have stuff taking up extra space and affecting like my pressure management and everything. So if I would have gone to see a PT and they just gave me a bunch of back exercises from my already strong back, like that wouldn't have helped anything. You, they need to be asking you about women's specific issues. Mm -hmm. Yep, agreed. Um, so we talked about dilators a little bit earlier. Can you define what a dilator is in case somebody doesn't know? So a dilator, it looks like it looks like a uh, like a dildo, but it, they come in different sizes. And what it does is, like we were saying before, the muscles in your pelvic floor are like anywhere else in your body, so they can get tight just like you have a tight hamstring. Um, and it, what a dilator does is when you insert it, it the idea is that it stretches that musculature out. The only problem is not every size is appropriate for every woman. Um, it might not be like there's three layers to the pelvic floor so it might not be a deep layer that's the problem it could be like the second or first layers which are more superficial so the dilators are the best idea initially only because you don't know where the deficits lie and what needs to be addressed versus doing like a general stretch if that makes sense mm -hmm. and then some people can have like sensations of tightness and stuff, but just stretching isn't really what they need, right? Like they have hypertonicity. Yeah. A dilator wouldn't exactly yeah. really help those people. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about it, like if you're just being told to go home with a dilator, but you're so used to having pain with penetration, why all of a sudden is this dilator going to be the magic bullet? Because you're going to be like, oh, crap, something else is going in there, and you're just going to tense up and add to the problem that's already happening. So I can't stand when people get sent home with dilators. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there's so much more to it than just, like, stuffing things in there. Because if that, it was that easy, like, this wouldn't be a problem to begin with, you know? Mm -hmm. And then talking about hypertonicity and having pain with sex and stuff, there's also the whole element of trauma, lifestyle, and just like your general level of anxiety and stuff that can all affect the way that you feel up there or down there. Just like some people say, like, say like, oh, I carry my tension in my shoulders, like in their neck or their shoulders always hurt. You can carry your tension the same way in your pelvic floor and that can lead to issues with sex and all kinds of stuff. Is that something that you've seen a lot of? Yep. Oh, yeah. And like you said it perfectly. And a lot of women don't realize that they could carry stress down there, but they absolutely do. And uh, yeah, once we work on like, even just talking to somebody about it. And that's why again, having a therapist is really helpful because you can talk about uh, what's going on and just, and just having someone here, here you have to help a little bit with the relaxation. And then a lot of times, especially with, like, sexual trauma and all of that, we work in conjunction with, like, a psychotherapist, which, again, is not, it doesn't mean something bad. If you're referred to somebody like that, they can really help in conjunction with us to kind of relax everything and get your life back again. Mm -hmm. um, and then while we're on the topic of, like, trauma and anxiety and all these other things that can affect the way that your body feels, I also want to add that. Um, with a lot of these problems, diet, lifestyle, how much you sleep, how much you exercise, all of that stuff can play a part too. Um, with incontinence in particular, a big part of helping women with incontinence can be getting rid of bladder irritants and looking at what they're eating. So caffeine, hot sauce, alcohol, all, all the things that I love <laughs> can all contribute to bladder <laughs> problems. Um, the amount of time you spend so can contribute to the general state of your nervous system and how tight your muscles, how 
feel and how fast you recover from exercise, how well coordinated you are, like sleeping is so, so, so important in the way that any part of your body feels, including your pelvic floor. Do you have anything else to add about pain? We have like... No, I think we hit it all. Cool. So I'm going to enlarge the five myths again. So we've gone over incontinence and that it's normal to pee when you exercise. What's actually true is that, that it's not. There's something you can do about it. Core exercise and that sit-ups and planks mean you're doing core exercise and that you're safe to do this six weeks after having a baby or other procedures. That is not true. Um, there's pressure management, breathing and bracing and all the stuff we talked about. That's real core exercise. Um, diastasis means that you can't ever exercise intensely. That's not true. Prolapse means that you can't exercise, ever exercise intensely. That's not true. And then pain is something you just have to deal with postpartum or in general, and that is also not true. There are a lot of different tools that we have to help women get past pelvic pain. So we have like three minutes left. I'm just going to hang out and see if anybody has any more questions. But that is it. Do you want to talk about your program, Melissa? Oh, yeah, my program. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, <laughs> I have a program um, that's actually starting this coming Monday, the 13th. And what it is, it's a series of classes dedicated to a specific pelvic floor uh, dysfunction. So Monday's class, it's three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You get like a little blurb and an action step each day. And I made it short and sweet, so it's no more than 20 minutes, just so you don't have to spend three hours a week with me. Uh, but next Monday, we're doing urinary incontinence. Two weeks after that, I think, is diastasis. Two weeks after that is pel pelvic pain or pelvic prolapse. And then pelvic pain is the last one. So it's a series. You could sign up for all of them or one. And, um, yeah, I'm really excited about it because I haven't done anything like this in class form yet. So... It can be really, really fun. And you can find information about that on my website. And I'll send a link out after everything. Nadia said, thank you. This has given me hope. Thank you for watching. That's exactly Yay. what we do. Yeah. Yay. Um, and then I don't have any programs or anything coming up. But like I've said a few times, I specialize in working with strength and barbell athletes. So I can help people with issues like being when you're deadlifting and those kinds of things. Um, so if anybody needs any help with those sorts of things, then just contact me. Thanks for having me on, Joshua. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I don't think we have any more. And thank you guys for tuning in. What? Okay. I said thank you, everybody, for tuning in, too. Okay, so we are signing off. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will send out a recording. Thank you.